God is great and greatly to be praised. So let's take some time today just to marvel at his majesty. Let's do it in prayer. Most gracious, mighty God in heaven, how amazing you are. We look around at the grandeur of this world, of your creation. We see you in the stars and the moon. We, we hear you in the mighty roar of the ocean. And see your grandeur in the mountains as we look across great plains and valleys. Oh, so many different ways and different things of beauty that we can see. And yet, in all that might and majesty, you desire that we call you Father. Not just Father, but Daddy. And so we come to you and pray that you help us with our needs. All the different needs that we might have. Some need comforting. Some need strength for the day. Some need um, health. Some need finances, Father. All these things you're in charge of, and we know you can take care of them. And so be with us now as we open up your word. Help us to get just a little more glimpse of your majesty and the beauty of your word. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So we've been uh, requested to sing a song, and I know you all know it, Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing Thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I fixed upon it Mount of God's unchanging love Oh, to grace how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts Amen. That's just a wonderful, loving song expressing what a great God we have. So we want to take a look today at um, a new, whole new series that we've been working on. And this is, a, as I was preparing for this, I ran across a story written by Max Lucado. Not a, a long story, just a short little introduction to the book, in fact, actually. Um, and what he said was there's a big, huge redwood tree that fell down in our redwood forests. And that it was 400 years old and it didn't fall from a storm. It didn't fall from lightning. It didn't fall from uh, an axe. It fell because of little tiny bugs, termites, that got in and ate it to weakness. So what a great illustration or way to bring us into the book of Jude. We're going to study the book of Jude. Very short little letter by a man named Jude. So we're going to take a look at the words that he says. We're just going to read the introduction today and, and get a little bit of a glimpse of what we're dealing with. We know that what he's talking about in this is he has a whole other plan he wants to write a book about or write a letter about. And by the way, this is one of those general letters. It's called a general epistle because... It's written for anyone who is a Christian, everyone. You know, uh, Paul wrote specific letters to specific people. 
He wrote 13 of the 27 books of the, of the New Testament. And he wrote, uh, every book that he wrote was to someone specifically, to a specific church or to a specific person. Every time you see the name of some of the author on it, that is a general letter that is written for everyone to get a hold of and understand, right? Uh, so Jude is writing a general letter because his name is on it and he claims to be the author. Let's take a look at the first two verses and we'll spring off from there. It says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Written about, uh, oh, somewhere between uh, 30 and 35 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So who is this Jude that we're talking about? Uh, there are several different ones. We all know the famous one, uh, the infamous one, Judas Iscariot, the, the deceiver. And in fact, he calls himself Judas, not Jude in the book, but uh, in the writing that he writes, uh, the translators did not want it to, anyone to be confused about who it was. So they used the word, uh, they, they used his nickname Jude instead of Judas. So who is this Judas? You know, why do we care about him? You know, we care about Paul. All his writing is amazing. But who is Jude? Well, he says he's the brother of James. Who's James? Well, guess what? There is a list in the Bible that has these two names together. So we are pretty secure in, belief, in understanding that this is um, the James that we're talking about. James, who is the leader, according to Paul, in Galatians, the first chapter, the 19th verse, according to Paul, James is the leader of the, of the um, early church in Jerusalem. Okay, so in Mark 6, 1 through 3, we find out who this James is and who this Jude is, or Judas is. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, he says accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas? Hear that? James and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So apparently this is Judas, one of Jesus' half-brothers. Yes, Mary had other kids. I know some people teach otherwise, but she did have other kids. Because remember, back in the second chapter of Luke, it says that Mary, uh, that Jesus was Jesus was Mary's firstborn. If he's a firstborn, that means there is a second and maybe a third and maybe a fourth. And apparently, a fifth and a sixth and a seventh, maybe even with the, the his sisters that are there. So this is Jesus' half-brother. Jude. And we take a look at this, the, this, though, we understand that they thought he was crazy, his brothers. His family thought he was crazy. When Jesus entered the house, in Mark, the third chapter, the 20th and 21st verses, he's out ministering in Capernaum. Uh, he is so busy all day long, there is no rest at all. Then Jesus entered the house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. He's crazy. And if we see, we go on and look at the seventh chapter, they weren't believers. They didn't believe uh, in him at all. And in the seventh chapter of, um, of John, we see this about him.
John 7. After this, Jesus went around to Galilee. This is the first, first verse, starting with the first verse. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers, that would be James and Judas and Simon and, and uh, Joseph's, um, Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the work you do. No one who wants to be a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing things, show yourself to the world. Verse 5, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. Okay, so now we see that he had these brothers. Can you imagine growing up with a perfect perfect person. All of us think, you know, the oldest one is always the perfect one. And uh, we always get compared to that. Can you imagine growing up with someone who truly was perfect, never doing anything wrong? Simon saying, not wanting to take the garbage out. Jesus saying, I'll do it. And so on, all the stuff that they just, no wonder they, you know, my brother is so annoying. He's just perfect. Um, the good thing is that the whole family, after he went through the death, we talked about last week, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. This is another great proof. His family, who did not believe, now believed. And in Acts 1, 14, we see this. They all joined together. That talks about the apostles. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So there they were. The family of Jesus was there uh, praying. So we know now that they didn't believe beforehand, but they did believe afterwards. In fact, they believed so much that they became leaders in the church, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the third through the fifth verse, he see, we see this. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to, to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas or Peter? So here we see that, yes, he had brothers and sisters who didn't believe in him. After his death, his burial and resurrection had changed them. They understood who he was and they became leaders in the church working as missionaries and, and other leaders. So Jude says this, approaches, that, uh, approaches the letter saying that he is Jude, a servant of Jesus and the brother of James. So he's writing this letter in an urgent plea from Jesus' brother, from Jesus' half-brother. Now, he doesn't cling to that status. He doesn't say, hey, by the way, I am the brother, half-brother of Jesus. I watched him grow up. I saw him. I'm related. You have to really respect me. What does he say? He says, I'm the brother of James. Now, why does he use James? Is he trying to get some status from that? Not really. He's trying to show who, uh, why you would even bother listening to him. It's a short letter written generally to all Christians urging something very important. So he needs you to understand where he's coming from, who he is. And so he says that he doesn't hold up. And there are a lot of people who fall into problems because they try to emphasize how important they are. He was not emphasizing how important he was. He was not clinging to status. He was simply saying, I am a part of the family. You know James, the leader of the church at Jerusalem. I'm his brother. I've been out being a missionary and I've noticed this in the churches. We'll talk about that. He says, I'm just a servant of Jesus. Oh, if we'd only all understand that. So many leaders fall because they get prideful. That's what was so amazing about uh, Billy Graham. 
stayed faithful all the time, stayed pure all the time. No one could point a finger of any accusation against him and did this throughout all kinds of things. But he was always just Billy Graham. He didn't say, call me the right reverend Billy Graham. He didn't say, I am Pastor Billy Graham. He didn't say, I am the lead elder Billy Graham. He didn't say, I am the most marvelous Billy Graham. He simply was Billy Graham. We all know him by that name. Everyone talked to him that way. He was a common man with humility. And this was what Jude was doing. I was simply saying, I have no status. I'm a servant of Jesus and a brother of James, so you can get the association. You know that I'm not just a fly-by-night guy. I've been around since for 30 years or more. Part of the leadership of the church. Part of the missionary crew that goes going out around the world. So the urgent plea comes from Jesus' brother. And what is that urgent plea? Who does that go to? It goes to God's people. God's people that God called, people he wanted. He called all the Israelite nation. Not all the Israelite nation followed, them, followed him, but he called them all, wanted them all to be there. God calls everybody. Not everybody answers the call. But those of us who do are specifically called by God. We can say, yeah, God called me. God wanted me in his family. I am precious to God. So it's God's call that reaches out to us. And we answer. When you hear that call, and I hope you all have. If you haven't yet heard the call, listen carefully. Maybe today he's calling you. Maybe he's asking for you to finally respond. Maybe he's saying, this urgent plea that, that Judas is giving is for you to hear. Not only are we called by God, but we are loved by God, he says. God loves us. Well, we all know that, right? For God so loved Chuck, no, so loved the world that whosoever, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he's writing to God's people who are called by God and loved by God and kept for Jesus. See, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, helping each one of us stay faithful. We talked about that last year after we spent a lot of time in uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus and we started saying, hey, we are given the Spirit and the Spirit brings us all this wonderful fruit uh, to produce in our life. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, so, um, self-control, all these things are from God. Oh, gentleness, don't forget that one. All that is from God and helps us to stay faithful to him, keeping us in Jesus, keeping us with Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says one more thing in these two verses. He says that you, he wants you to have mercy, peace, and love in abundance. What does that mean? Actually, I think what, uh, what the Greek is saying there is that you have it increasingly. You have mercy, you have peace, and you have love increasingly so that every day you grow a little more in mercy. Every day you grow a little more in peace. Every day you grow a little more in love. Let's understand mercy as kindness. And let's understand peace as serenity. And let's understand love as selflessness. So we're growing in kind of, oh, by the way, it doesn't, brings us back to the last several sermons we've been dealing with. Sir, uh, and then last week, what I said was, grace overwhelms mercy. Remember that? I said, grace overwhelms mercy. Now we don't need mercy because we have grace. And then along comes Jude. And he says, by the way, I want you to have mercy and show it in increasing manners. I want it to be increasing in your life. So I guess I was wrong. No, actually, you know, I heard a great little uh, comment from a man named Charlie Kirk. 
And he, he said, he put these three things together that I had talked about, justice, mercy, and, and uh, grace. He said, the way to understand that, and this is one, I wish I had to come up with that. It's great, is justice. Let's say you got in big trouble, you know, did something really bad and you were dragged off to court and they found you guilty. And the, the judge, when it's time to sentence you, throws the book at you and you are, you, you are punished completely and wholly. You're kicked out of society and land in a jail to, to, to rot for the rest of your life. That's justice. But let's say you're taken to that same court. You're working in that same way. And when the judge gets up, he says, oh, you did this, but you cop to it. You understood that you, you did this and you're sorry. So we're going to be a little lenient. It's not going to be so bad. Maybe you'll work uh, it off for uh, 60 days doing community service. But you're free on your own recognizance. That's mercy. So we have justice, which is punishing for them for your doing wrong. Mercy, which is punishing, but makes it a lot easier. And then let's say the third time you go into, into court and you have, um, you stand before the judge and you are declared guilty. But someone in the room as the judge stands up and ready to drop the gavel and say, you're going to be punished. Someone stands up and says, your honor, I'll take that punishment. I, th I thought that was great. That's a great explanation of the three, justice, mercy, and grace. So we know mercy is kindness towards those around us, doing the right things. We talked about that in Matthew 25, how Jesus has the she separates the sheep from the, the sheep from the goats and sends the goats one place and the sheep to the other place. And the sheep are always doing kind things to people. Clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, helping the poor, visiting the sick, going to the prisons, just to be kind to people. The next thing is peace, he says. I want you to have peace in this life. To know that God is in charge, that my brother Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that that gives you all the peace you can possibly afford. You have peace with God, and therefore you should have peace with fellow man. There's nothing you can be anxious about, nothing that brings you anxiety. And you're always thinking of the other people because your love is selfless. You know, you're not thinking about yourself. You think about others all the time. So he's approaching this. He's with, the, with an urgent plea, and we'll learn more about that urgent plea next week. Uh, but uh, the urgent plea of, you know, protect yourself from people getting inside with false doctrine. He's dealing with false doctrine already 30 years into the church. And there are people who are trying to pull people away, teach you. So he's saying, you're, you're going to have to, in this letter, he said, you're going to have to be aware that there are false teachers trying to get into the church inside and try to eat it out. Because like that tree falling down in the forest, it, uh, the strength of the wind and the storms for 400 years didn't knock it down. The, the lightning strikes that it might have taken, the fires that it might have gone through, all didn't phase it. But the little bugs inside destroyed it. So we have to watch the church as a whole. Everybody needs to be protectors. Understanding that false teaching gets in and destroys the church and disunifies the church and causes all kinds of and all there's no one comes in and says hey by the way I'm a false teacher I'm a false uh, I don't believe in God they they kind of try to fit in and do some nice things and we'll talk about that as we come along as we go through this book short book we're going to take five weeks to go through it uh, we'll be picking it apart and and letting it fill us up but today know this that the urgent plea comes from Jesus' brother, Jude. He's humble in spirit as a servant of God. 
He's calling to all of God's people. And he's calling for mercy, peace, and love. Hoping that on each of us in growing manner. So we take this book and we get a little bit of blessing out of it. In fact, at the end, there's one of the best praises of doxology. Just the last two verses, just great. I love to use it at every funeral because it's powerful. So we'll wash our mouth, mouth out of all those um, evil false teachers that try to pull people away with that great doxology at the end. I'm looking forward to this. I hope you will too. And join me each week. And I hope now that maybe you understand that you are called by God, that God is calling your name, and that you should respond to it. You should say, okay, finally, Father, I'm hearing, and I realize I need you because you love me. And then I want to be kept for Jesus. I want to be to bask in your glory. I want the spirit to hold me and to help me walk in my daily life. And I want to grow every day in mercy, peace, and love, in kindness, serenity, and selflessness. Thank you, most precious, mighty God, for the encouragement we get from Judas. Thank you that we learn so much. We ask, Father, that you help us every day to live that way. And Father, if there's anyone who needs to respond to you, let them do that. And then let them help them to let other people know that they've made this commitment. Thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we come to God and we thank him for being kept and being uh, for the love and for the fact that he called us. And we celebrate that through the death, the burial, and resurrection, through uh, the participation in communion, the participation in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, the cup of thanksgiving that we have the body that takes our sins away. So let's participate in that right now together, knowing that there are people all around the world who are at this time taking these things too. So Jesus on the night he was betrayed took the bread and broke it and blessed it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat all of it and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the sins of many. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do this in remembrance of me, Jesus says. Oh, gracious, mighty God, thank you again for that wonderful act of grace that reminds us that we are sinners saved by the death of, of Jesus Christ and looking forward to eternal life because of the res resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us all to live every day of our lives dedicated to that, showing an increasing measure of mercy and peace and love. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, thank you for joining our short service this morning. Don't forget our expenses continue. We need your tithes and offerings. They will really be a blessing. They are a blessing to us. Thank you for your faithfulness. We love the first responders in our community. We love our medical professionals in the front line in this battle, our truckers and delivery people, and all the essential workers. And we invite them all. We would love you all to come and join us on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock on Google Hangouts. And you can find that on our website. You can click on Google Hangouts at seven o'clock on uh, Tuesday night and join us as we talk about the sermon, as we look at some 
passages behind the sermon that that uh, brought this all together for me and hopefully I was able to share it to you. So let us refresh our minds and know this as Paul says to the Ephesians, grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. See you next week. God bless.